How many of you here today are diabetic? Oh, raise your hand. Or know somebody who's diabetic? Is it a family member, friend? Yes. Uh, what is it that diabetics need to do? They need to prick their finger and, and draw blood, right? And 45 minutes after dinner, they want to have a piece of pie. So they have to do it again, right? It's because the blood chemistry can change so drastically over a short period of time. Well, what if we could do that continuously? What if we could measure the blood sugar continuously? What if we could measure for biomarkers that are indicative of a heart attack that's happening? Well, these are some of some good questions. Um, but my name is Nicholas Twine. I'm a graduate researcher at the University of Cincinnati in the Novel Devices Lab. So how is it that we can continuously access these, these things in the blood that we're trying to measure? It turns out that there are actually other biofluids, alternatives to blood, um, such as urine, saliva, uh, sweat, even the fluid in your eyes that contain these analytes that we're trying to measure. And so each one of those, let's take these, these examples here. So cortisol, for instance. So each one of these biofluids poses their, their own significant challenges. Microneedles, some companies have used microneedles, but even those are invasive and invite infection. Uh, urine, in order to continuously measure that, you'd have to insert a catheter, right, which isn't very ergonomical. And even for uh, gathering the fluid in your eyes, that's not very ergonomical either. There's a lot of challenges there. Uh, so sweat is ergonomical. You sweat everywhere in your body. You have the highest concentration of sweat glands in your feet. But let's say that on your arm, you have 100 glands in a centimeter square area on your forearm. Well, if each one of those glands is sweating at five nanoliters per minute, you've got half, a, half of a microliter of fluid that you can sense and analyze. But who cares? It's just salty water, right? And that's, that's a, such a small sample of fluid. Well, it's more interesting that you, than you might anticipate. So there are only two, sweat, uh, two cell layers in your sweat duct that separate that from a sea of interstitial fluid, which actually is collagen mixed in with all of these other bio, these biomarkers, these analytes. And so here we have you know, some examples, right? So electrolytes such as sodium and potassium uh, metabolites, glucose, right? If you're a diabetic, that's what you're trying to measure. Uh, lactate, right? That your muscles produce small molecules and other examples. Uh, proteins, even toxins and to uh, pathogens you can measure uh, from your sweat. So sweat is a viable alternative to other biofluids. So here I put a short clip of what the Novel Devices Lab is working on right now. This is our major project, which is a sweat patch. So the idea here would be to have this sweat patch that would be about the size of a band-aid that you would fit on your arm. And inside of it, you would be able to package your electronics, which there, in past prototypes, we've used RFID and Bluetooth to be able to communicate with your smartphone what's actually happening. Underneath of that, you would have a disposal, a gel, where all the excess fluid can go when, it's, when you're done sensing it. But inside here, you'd see this white wick, and that would collect your sweat and move it across your sensors um, to be analyzed. And as we zoom in here, you'll see two different types of sensors. But the main two that we would be interested in are ion selective electrodes to measure sodium and potassium levels, and EABs, which are electro aptamer based sensors. And so aptamers are essentially, I like to consider them DNA magnets. I'm an electrical engineer in my background, so. Uh, the biology world gets pretty confusing, but uh, I consider them DNA magnets. One side attaches to an electrode, and as a fluid is present with, let's say, cortisol that this aptamer is designed for, then this, bi this biomarker will attach to your aptamer and fold over. And what happens is there's more electron exchange with your substrate, and your electronics can amplify that. So then, by however much is amplified, you can tell the concentration of different analytes or biomarkers in your, your fluid. So that's this overarching project, and each piece has its own team of researchers that are working on it. But as for me, my master's thesis was the sweat management system, so collecting the sweat off of your skin and moving it a couple centimeters to get to your sensors. But it has its own challenges there. 
because microfluidics don't behave the same way that, that larger bodies of fluid behave. If you have a cup and it's eight ounces of water and you dump it upside down, all the water comes out. If you have a cup and it's a microliter of water and you dump that upside down, it does whatever it wants. It just stays in the cup. And so there's two major things that we can manipulate to influence the flow, right, the capillary flow of fluids. You have your contact angle, which can be summed up with whether your fluid sticks to your surface or balls up and runs off, similar to a lotus leaf. And those terms would be hydrophilic, meaning it likes the surface, or hydrophobic, meaning it balls up, bounces around, and runs off. And then the geometry of your channels, and both of those govern the capillary flow. So using those principles, we decided we'd try to make a device. And so our initial attempts, we had, a nickel, or we had an aluminum mold that was the shape that we wanted. And PDMS was the material that we used because it's cheap. You mix the two parts together and you bake it in the oven and it comes out the right size. But as an undergraduate researcher, I learned some valuable lessons um, in uh, asking questions when you don't know things. But I ruined an $800 mold within the first couple months of working there. Those are the kind of things people don't tell you about research. It's all the mistakes that they've made along the way. But uh, we did get a few samples that were the right shapes. And so here I have a video. and. Um, plasma treating PDMS. And essentially these purple lightning bolts are making hydroxyl groups on the PDMS, which make it hydrophilic, so meaning the water sucks down. But the problem with this also is that it only lasts for a few hours. So we needed an alternative. We needed something that was the right shape and that would stay hydrophilic for a long period of time. And so we moved on. We, we thought, well, let's try some other plastics and polymers and materials. So we decided to make another mold that we would heat up the material and press in. And so we made this master mold out of nickel. And the first month went by, and I learned a very, value, very valuable lesson of making sure your surface is planarized, meaning very flat within a certain degree of accuracy. Because I didn't do that, and I spent the next two months sanding this thing down, trying to get it to be the right planarization so that we could make these. And I failed. And my professor kept asking me, Nicholas, where's this mold? Where's the mold? Where's the mold? Dr. Heikenfeld, I'm almost done. I'm almost done. And then he said, no, just after, we got to February, and it was about two months, and he said, let me see it. And so I showed it to him. And he said, Nick, we should have dropped this m a month ago. And so I learned a very valuable lesson, and that's fail, but not just fail, it's how you fail. Fail early and fail often. Um, so that's, it's very important, but that's a lesson that I learned. So we were, we were able to successfully make this sheet, uh, this polymer with this material with the right shapes, right? And so here's an example of each six of these rectangles is uh, the, the right shape and size. And so here's a zoomed in version of what that would look like. Hexagonal posts raised off of the surface. Now for a centimeter uh, square, we designed this to where 100 nanoliters of fluid would completely saturate this device. And so we, we were able to successfully do that. But we still had the problem of the surface chemistry, right? The contact angle. So we, were able, we successfully achieved the, the geometrical shapes we wanted. Um, but the first chemical that I tried, I soaked a sample in it, and it started outgassing. And they have what are called thiols. And thiols are sulfur-hydrogen bonds. And what happens is that the hydrogen pops off, and the sulfur can bond to a gold substrate. Well, when it does that, it's also very stinky. And so it outgassed into the lab, out of, out of the fume hood, into the lab, into the office area, and the other lab. And my professor walked in, and he said, oh oh, what is that smell? And everyone pointed at me and said, Nicholas. And I said, oh. So I ruined an $800 mold. I, I was outgassing these horrible fumes all over the lab. I thought for sure it was, it was the end of me. I was going to be fired. And Dr. Heikenfeld said, he said, come on with me. We're going to walk to my car. I thought for sure he was going to say, Nicholas, you're a great person, but you suck. Find a different career path. <laughs> but he didn't. He said, Nicholas, I want to bring you on for your master's. So that was where all this began. But here are examples of a few chemicals that we tried, but we had the same problem. They only last for about a day. So one of the black magicians, excuse me, I mean chemists in our lab, uh, he decided to try something very fancy, linking amino acids together to make multiple sulfur bonds to this gold substrate. And so I, I thought, well, this is where I learned another lesson. I, I don't know what's happening with the chemistry. He's teaching me, but I learned just try it because you could spend the next two or three years trying to teach yourself all of the minute details about what is happening, or you get on a team and you, you try it, and you see what works and you see what doesn't. So what we ended up doing is linking cysteine and aspartic acid, and pay very close attention. These yellow and uh, white balls that are hanging off of the end of all of these chains, those are the sulfur hydrogen groups, the thiols. 
So here is a short clip. Uh, this is the uh, molecule that we actually created, and we called it 7 mer. So we have the patent on this. It's very, it was a very awesome thing to be a part of, but it successfully achieved the contact angles we wanted and lasted for weeks. So it was, it was a, a great achievement for our lab. So we achieved our geometric requirements, we achieved our contact angle, and now we had to test it. So this here is a picture of our artificial skin setup. Now this little blue square here in this lure holder is the artificial skin. And it, it has the same geometrical, it's an exact replica of human skin. But it even models the microfluidic properties of, of human skin. And so when I was being taught how to do this, it was, it was a professor, she was uh, doing her postdoc here, she was from China. And I said, Vivian, how did you figure out how to do this? This is incredible. And the process took forever. It takes a whole day. Well, it's, it's forever comparatively, but it seems like it takes that long, but it's a lot of fabrication. And I said, how did you figure out how to do this? And she said, ah, Nick, you must do many, many times. And I learned that lesson because it was a valuable one to carry on through my entire master's thesis and all of the research. They wouldn't call it research if you didn't have to redo it and redo it and redo it. So we successfully made it, we successfully tested this, this collector on artificial skin, and so we had to move on to human subjects testing. So we stimulated sweat to get the sweat rate to about five nanoliters per minute per gland. We tested to make sure that it was doing that by weighing a paper disc before and after a certain period of time. And then we created a setup using screen printed electrodes to measure when each one of those electrodes would ping. And so we were successfully able to move this tiny amount of fluid uh, over two centimeters uh, from the location where it was collected uh, to our sensors. Now these weren't the high, the, the high performance sensors, these were just uh, testing for conductivity, but we beat any time that has been out there uh, to this day. Um, excuse me. So if there's anything that I leave you with here about my research, about what we do in the Novel Devices Lab, it's three things. Fail early and often. Just try it and you must do many, many times. So, thank you. <laughs>